All right. Um, I'm sure some more people will trickle in, but we will get started since time is valuable for journalists and the people who uh, accept our phone calls. I understand we have a lot of uh, public information officers interested in this topic as well, and that's great. We welcome you. I'm Noelle Phillips. I'm on the board of directors for the Denver Press Club. Um, we are a nonprofit institution that supports journalists and journalism in Colorado. Uh, we have a actual club with a nice bar that's been closed because of COVID, but we welcome all of y'all to come visit us um, and to look at our website and encourage uh, you to join us um, through a membership. And um, we really, we try to do panels like this to help educate journalists and further journalism in our community. I'm joined today by Jeff Roberts, who's the director of the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition, and Justin Twardowski, a Denver, University of Denver law student. And they're going to talk about um, outrageous CORA fees in Colorado. I know I got one this fall for a CORA request. The bill was $3,200. Seemed a little excessive to me. Um, it forces journalists to reassess what they're asking for and is it really worth that amount? It's a serious issue. So we'll start out, let Jeff introduce himself and then Justin and then we'll get started um, with me asking them questions and then we will open it up to our audience to ask questions as well. So Jeff? Jeff, you're muted. Okay, now I can unmute. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jeff Roberts. I'm executive director of the Colorado Freedom of Information Coalition, former Denver Post reporter and editor uh, from a while ago now. Um, if you guys don't know what CFOIC is, we are a, a 501c3 nonprofit. Our main mission is to educate uh, Coloradans and also journalists in, per in particular about their rights under Colorado's open government laws. So that's the two uh, public records laws in Colorado, the open meetings law, court access, that type of thing. Um, and we also do advoca advocacy. Um, as a 501c3, we're a little bit limited in how much adv advocacy we can do, at least lobbying, but we, we promote government transparency. We promote the use of these laws. And uh, uh, this is a great, this is a great topic. It's a very frustrating topic. Um, I One of the things I do is run a freedom of information hotline. Uh, and I've been doing this for the last seven years or so. And I've taken almost 3,700 questions in that time. And a lot of them pertain to costs of public records. And it, these are the most frustrating questions um, that I get because it's very, I, I, I have some advice for, for people who, who uh, ask me about this, but it's, it's kind of limited advice because the law is really on the side of people in government. And, um, and so CORA and, and the criminal justice records law um, give agencies um, uh, quite a bit of discretion to, to charge um, uh, what they what they can under the law, um, and um, uh, and so we uh, have you know gotten so frustrated with this, and we know that requesters are so frustrated with this. We asked Justin to uh, research the history of Cora fees and uh, produce a report for us with some recommendations, which we did um, in uh, came out with in um, October. And that is uh, linked at the top of the chat um, within a blog article that, that I wrote about it, summarizing it, uh, the reports linked within there. And so um, uh, we're trying to, you know, what we see our role is to uh, call uh, attention to issues with the open government laws. Cost is a big issue, um, as well as records retention, uh, many others that we've pointed out. And uh, we hope that 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 leads to perhaps some reform. Um, we as a 501c3, we, can, we can't really do much lobbying. We don't have a lobbyist. We, would not, we don't have the budget for a lobbyist. But we do um, work with the Press and Broadcasters Association and sometimes other organizations like Common Cause um, 
uh, to try to get uh, some changes. So I'm, I'm also on the legislative committee for the press association and uh, really try to point them in certain directions. And this is one of those. So we have been, we have been trying to get um, some action on this. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that there are legislators paying attention, uh, but we don't know for sure yet. So um, we'll see, we'll see what happens with that. Okay, Justin, why don't you um, talk, introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about the title of the report's a little hard to say, a return to nomin nominalcy, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> restoring proper balance for CORA costs. And I just put a link directly to that report in the chat, but Justin, why don't you talk a little bit about how you did the, first, I'd be curious why you're in, was in, you were interested in this and then how you did the research and some key findings. Sure, so um, my name is Justin Twardowski for everyone. Hi, thanks for having me. I am a third year law student at the University of Denver currently about to graduate in, in May. Um, my interest in Quora took a bit of a roundabout path. I originally started my career as a teacher, a high school physics teacher. And in 2015, I moved away from that career. I had discovered that my administrators were changing grades without letting, I guess, teachers know or following proper processes. I resigned and documented all this. And that was my first exposure to the world of journalism <laughs> through being a whistleblower. So in the time that followed, I learned about Quora, how I could try and obtain further information. I had concerns that persisted after I had left that position and I wanted to investigate and try to rectify those for the public. And it was in that period that I learned a lot of things about Quora and just how the inner workings of public bodies work. I learned about deletion of documents. I learned that shortly after I'd resigned, they basically deleted all of my emails, <laughs> which kind of went against an internal policy, but who says they have to follow that? And I also started to, I kicked around for a little bit. I had a hodgepodge of jobs. I worked at a tea shop. I um, delivered mail for a little bit in Edgewater. So I may have delivered some letters to some of you. <laughs> and I also worked as a private investigator, which is where I was really stymied by the Quora request fees. Obviously, I can't say I've ever had a high paying job in my, <laughs> my history being a teacher or working many part-time jobs. But I found that when I was trying to pursue various things, if I got hit with requests that were even a couple hundred dollars, that would stymie me, that would close the door to me. And I found myself often trying to hone in right at that one hour mark so that I could get a free request, but also being a little paranoid about what they might do in reaction to my interest. So I became aware early on of the fees that burden people, and also the fact that some government bodies, you know, absent retention policies may get wind of what you're looking into and who knows what they'll do, redact things, delete things. And that struck me as a troubling balance. And in that regard, this is something that made my interest in line with the CEO FOIC's interest of addressing these high policy, these high fees that we're being hit with. So to briefly transition to my, uh, my research, I would like to first discuss why I chose what I did and my methodology, just so that we're all clear on that. I did not choose school districts to further harass them <laughs> after my experiences. I chose them because it's something that's constantly in the public's interest whether it's policies our state legislature is enacting and seeing if school districts are you know, following that or bucking, or you know, in the tragic cases that we've had in recent years of things like the STEM school shooting. These are areas of strong public interest and also have provided a very large sample size. So I felt like this would provide data of what's happening on the ground locally across the state. 
So I specifically chose school districts off the Colorado Department of Education's website. I stuck to the traditional ones of which there are 178. And with those 178 districts, I looked for a posted policy for each of them. I found that I believe it was 40 or so did not have posted policies, about 44 if I remember correctly. So those were eliminated from my analysis because I could not get any data of what fees they are charging. And per Cora, if it's not posted, they can't charge a fee. I noted that six of the remaining 137 districts had ambiguous policies. Either the dates were problematic or unclear, or the prices or fees that they were charging were unclear. So I was left with 131 school districts. And from that, I performed three different analyses. The first thing was I looked at the, the fee that each of these school districts are charging. And if you have my report handy, you can definitely reference the data at this point. This would be on page 14. And it provides a nice little graph that, provide, that, uh, that shows what these different districts are charging. And basically, as of now, 29% of school districts of these 131 are charging the maximum statutory fee of 33.58. 49% are charging $30 per hour, which is the previous statutory fee. I would guess that they haven't updated quite yet. 18% are charging reasonable fees, which means they haven't updated in quite a long, quite a long time, pre-2014 essentially. And then there were about 4% that just kind of went rogue and did something different. So that was our first piece of data. And we can see already that considerable amount is charging the prior fee of 30, 30% 30 roughly is charging the maximum fee. So that provides our snapshot in time of where we are currently at on a state level. The second thing I wanted to do is I wanted to get insight into how often are these school districts charging the maximum fee that they are allowed to. So for this, I had to look at the dates of enactment for each of the policies. I looked at the dates of enactment and the maximum fee at that time, and I organized these policies into different groups. And this data would be shown on the following page, page 15. And this is where the data gets more alarming. It shows that out of these, these districts that provided data, 85% of them at the time they either enacted, reviewed, or revised their policy chose the highest one that they were allowed to by law. Only 15% of the time did they look at the law and say, we aren't doing that, which to me struck me as a substantial and excuse me, a troubling finding. So that was our second piece of data. The third and final piece of data that I looked at focused on those districts that were charging the maximum allowed fee. And this again led to a troubling finding. I specifically followed up with those districts and asked for salaries of the employees performing research and retrieval because I wanted to compare that salary or that wage to the statutory fee. I wanted to see how they compared. A fair number of school districts, I believe it was 18, just did not reply to me, which I was being pretty lenient with given the COVID circumstances of the time. Another fair number of them, I wanna say around six or so, basically just sent me evasive responses and that they sent me spreadsheets of their entire staff roster and all of their salaries. Basically saying, well, here's everyone, but I'm not gonna tell you who fulfills these requests. So that was useless. Only nine districts actually gave me substantive concrete data. So this is a relatively small sample. 
three of those had employees who earned more than the maximum fee. I believe the highest rate I saw was someone earning $119,000 per year. That was a small school district where the superintendent was doing the research and retrieval. We had 33% where there was a mixture of employees earning more and less, depending apparently on who was working that day. And we had, and this is the striking portion, 33% whose employees all earned less than the statutory fee. What this means is that if you were to make a request in that district, and if they charge the maximum fee, they would, in theory, turn a profit from that CORA request. And the lowest wage I saw was roughly $14 per hour. I think it was $14.80 something cents. So a striking $16 difference there. So those were my key findings from going through this process of evaluating roughly 130 school district policies to see what they're charging, how often they're charging the most that they can, and how often that maximum charge is justified. Wow, I um, two things there. The one where they're a person who makes $14 and some change in an hour is fulfilling the request and they're charging me $33.58 an hour. Um, I would hope that we that might be a strategy for reporters to find out how much they're paying the person responding and then ask them to justify the extra $16. Um, so that that's really interesting. And then um, I didn't realize that per core, if they don't have a fee posted on their website that they cannot charge is that that pertains to every government agency. Yeah, I can I can address that. Um, so the, the legislature, you know, before 2014, um, there really wasn't anything in Cora about about fees. Um, it was something that really was was more um, the product of case law. Uh, judicial decisions, which and and Justin did a lot of research about this, uh, you know, about what what constituted a reasonable fee, and then and so um, we uh, and other groups kept hearing that the charges were just all over the place around the state. What the legislature ended up doing in 2014 was capping the hourly rate, uh, but then uh, did not addressing the number of hours that can be charged. So you have an equation of of a of a cap, which was originally uh, thirty dollars per hour, now thirty three fifty eight times x number of hours, and that's where it can really add up. And you're right, Noel, that uh, the statute also says that if there is if they have not published their fee policy, they can't charge anything. Um, and and uh, now six years later occasionally we actually hear about some agency that never did that. It's usually some smaller government that doesn't get a lot of requests and didn't, never did that. But I, that's, that's one of the things that I always tell people to make sure that they've actually published it because if they haven't, they can't, they can't charge you for research and retrieval. Where um, is that supposed to be published? It's, it's really supposed to be published on their website, but unless, you know, if they don't have a website, you know, some other way that they publish official documents. Um, so, so that is, uh, you know, one thing. Uh, early on, we, we, there were a lot, a lot of uh, governments that, that failed to do that, but I don't think a whole lot have forgotten about that anymore at this point. Um, but you know, as as Justin also found out, you know, there's there's nothing in the law that requires the agency, the government entity, to to um, give you any kind of receipt about you know, a breakdown of the charges. You know, they could say it's going to take 30 hours to do this, but you're left sometimes wondering why. Uh, and if you ask why, um, hopefully they will tell you. But there's nothing that really requires them to break that down. Um, and, and a couple other things uh, that are interesting is uh, not all states even charge for research and retrieval. Um, Ohio doesn't. Um, and Colorado, Justin, um, uh, 
what what was the law like at the, at the very beginning of of Cora in 1968? You're mute. Yeah, there you are. Thanks. I just got unmuted. So initially, what happened was the legislature permitted custodians, record custodians, to make reasonable rules and regulations that would prevent undue interference with the custodian's duties or the duties of the custodian's office and to protect the records. And this actually kind of floated by for quite a while until we got that nominal fee that arose with the, the Blacks case. What happened when we hit the Blacks case is the judge basically decided that one, research and retrieval fees are permitted by Cora. In the legislative history back in the 60s, they, decide, they considered whether or not we should go with a completely free system of open records requests. And they concluded that the legislature decided against that. The judge also picked out one key word from the legislative history, and that was the word nominal. They felt that a records custodian could be able to charge a nominal fee for research and retrieval. Now, there is a fair argument, in my opinion, about the meaning of nominal. The judge went with the meaning as of the time the judge made their ruling which was trifling as compared to what would be expected, which seems like a very vague definition to me. If they were to go back in the date of the legislature in the 60s and look at the legal definition, it basically means entitle only. And that definition of nominal actually carries out in a lot of other areas of Colorado law if you are in a civil case and you get nominal damages, essentially that means that you're getting $1. You're getting an, an award that's basically not substantial and mainly in title only. And we got a couple cases that interpreted the nominal fee after that. And they basically arrived at the fact that anything from about 15 to $25 for voluminous or really big requests would be permitted under this nominal standard. So that's where we got to where we were before HB 1411-93 and before we got that initial $30, $30 now $33.58 maximum fee. Well, I know as a working journalist, the outrageous fees certainly feel obstructionist. You're like, well, they just don't want us to get what we're asking for. So what are some of the strategies, Jeff, until somebody does something about the law that a working journalist can use to try to get around uh, these fees? Yeah, um, if, if you guys have a copy of uh, our Sunshine Laws guide, uh, and I'm, I'm working on an online version of that, which is gonna come out fairly soon, I've got, a lot of this in there, but you know the if you, if you get a, a response, and this this frequently happens when you request emails. You know that is that is often when the price gets gets really high because um, they'll say it's going to take you know so many hours to to find these things and look through them and all that. Um, I, I wouldn't you know I wouldn't stop if you get this bill for hundreds or thousands of dollars. Uh, I would. I would try to negotiate. So, you know, get the get the records custodian on the phone. Try to you know see uh, why is it costing so much. Um, if is there a way you can narrow the request to still uh, get something useful but make it more affordable? So, you know, you're talking about search terms, and a lot of this is just common sense, but, but you know, it, it, it requires some back and forth sometimes. Uh, you know, date parameters, search terms, name parameters, um, if you have specific email addresses of people who received uh, correspondence, the names of the public officials who are most likely to have, have uh, sent or received uh, the correspondence, 
um, being as specific as you can, helping them uh, find the records um, uh, can help. Um, you know, sometimes you you may not want to let on exactly what you're looking for, but if you're if you're comfortable talking to the records custodian about what you're really looking for, um, that can help as well. Um, so, I mean, it's it really is uh, you know, a frustrating thing for both the requester and when they asked me about it, because I only have so much advice to offer. Um, you know, if, if it really comes down to the records custodians sticking to their guns, you really want the records anyway, um, you know, you got to think about other ways to, to, to go at it. Um, you know, I've got some advice uh, in, in, our, in our booklet about that, you know, can you get somebody else to make the CORA re request for you? Can uh, an elected official in that government who, who sees um, why the public might want or a journalist might want these records, can they ask for the records? Um, can you share the cost with other requesters? Um, I've seen news organizations do that uh, on occasion when everybody knows they're, they're going after the same thing. Um, you know, if it's something costs uh, 15 or $1,500 or uh, $2,000, I've seen news, news organizations uh, do that. It's not, doesn't work when a story is competitive, but, but uh, that helps sometimes. Um, I've seen records, I've seen requesters crowdfund the cost of their records requests. So doing it online and getting, getting people to chip in, or if you're, you know, you're someone, an, an activist in your neighborhood and you're going for uh, certain records, you know, getting a bunch of people together to pool the cost um, is, is what I've seen that type of thing uh, happen as well. Um, you know, as, as for the request itself, uh, you know, if you can be as specific as you can, uh, you're, you know, and helping them find the records, uh, that can uh, make a difference. That can sometimes lower the cost. What, what is often pretty frustrating is some agencies like the city of Denver tend to run everything through their city attorney's office. And so you also get uh, the time that city attorney spends uh, looking for privileged documents or some other CORA exception that they can, they, they can find. Now they don't, they can't charge more than that maximum rate in CORA. They're not charging their attorney uh, billing fee, but it still adds up quite a bit. Um, and that can be frustrating, but you know, if, if, if the, the records um, uh, don't require that, type of thing where, you know, they might have some privilege in there. Um, hopefully you can get around that type of thing. But, um, you know, sharing the cost with other requesters, if, if you can do that, um, uh, you know, always asking, you know, because a lot of you are journalists, always asking for a waiver of fees because it's in the public interest to understand a certain, a certain issue. There is nothing in Cora that requires uh, them to offer you offer a discount or a free, um, um, you know, f free uh, or, or, or no fees because something is in the public interest. Uh, but you can always ask um, and make that argument. Um, you know, that might be one of the things that we try to get reform on. Um, uh, the other possibility is, you know, the difference between a, a request that's in the public interest versus a commercial request. Maybe there's something we can do along those lines. And Justin could probably talk a little bit more about, about some of the, the recommendations from his report, you know, what we're, what we're um, trying to get legislators to think about uh, as far as reform. All right, Justin, what are your recommendations? Well, I agree with Jeff on that first point. In terms of the current, you know, landscape and environment, aside from working with the records custodians, it's very difficult to try and lower your costs. There are very limited options. So I am very much in favor of some legislative changes, ideally. 
and I will give some data at the end to kind of explain why. But the first thing I think, I think I see this as two steps. The first thing we need to do is we need the legislature first to take notice. And in kind of a grass, grassroots kind of method, I think we first need to make it visible. How bad is this problem? We need to tweet about it. We, well, journalists, excuse me. <laughs> I'm just a lowly law student. Um, you know, tweet about it. If you get a bad quote, if you get an extreme egregious quote, tweet about it, Facebook about it. Make sure that it's in the public domain and that people are aware of it. I think the second thing is we need to add context to it. If you get an egregious or exorbitant quote, I think it really adds to it if you can add, you know, this is how many subscriptions it would take just to fund this one request. This is how much a journalist's salary is compared to what we're quoted for this one request. I think adding that context and emphasizing the strain that it's putting on an already strained industry, because I know that it's tough times in the journalism industry. I think that is really key. And I think the last thing is just to really emphasize why this matters. For the past you know, several years, we've been dealing with a lot of accusations of tribalism in the media and whatnot. This benefits everyone. No matter who's in control, who's not, there's always there, there's always someone there to hold them accountable, to put them in check. And if that isn't an across the board solution, if that doesn't have across the board appeal, then I just don't know what to say. This is squarely in everyone's best interest. And I think the second thing is, in terms of the legislature, when they do act, we need them to act in a thoughtful and forward looking way. Like Jeff said, I mean, we have these other different fees that can come up. We have data manipulation fees. We have attorney review fees. There's no reason to say that if we suddenly lower the research and retrieval costs that you know, government agencies aren't going to start suddenly having more things go to attorney review or more things going to needing requiring of, um, of data manipulation to get your request fulfilled. So I think that's important. This is like a game of whack-a-mole. If you press one place, it's just gonna pop up somewhere else. So we need something that's thoughtful and looks ahead to that. So now to get into policy. One of the things that I think is essential, well actually two things that I think are essential for the legislature to do first are itemized receipts and record retention policies. I wanna emphasize here that I'm not advocating for an immediate research and retrieval adjustment because I want it to be a calculated research and retrieval adjustment that won't need to be circled back on when new problems arise. So why I'm emphasizing itemized receipts. As I found in the report, there were you know, government bodies charging the maximum fee and paying their employees who did that work $14.80 per hour. If we have receipts, then we can look at some data and say, hey, this is not balancing the government administrative burden with the public's right to know. This is outright profiteering and that is problematic. The second thing that I think is important from that is that if we have an itemized receipt system, we have data that can be gathered that will formulate how we can adjust our research and retrieval policy going forward and pick something that's the best fit. So I think that is absolutely key. In terms of record retention, I'm throwing that out there because it is a problem. If we don't have immediate changes to the research and retrieval fees and we're stuck making smaller ones, as I mentioned earlier, there's no reason to believe that things won't be deleted. Or if they have an internal policy, there's no reason to say that the time period specified in that policy won't lapse and things will be deleted just automatically. I know for a fact there are state agencies that have you know, 90 day limits and then things are deleted. So I think those two hand in hand are the first step. 
in terms of the second step, I think that that is identifying and implementing the, the research and retrieval policy. As Jeff said, some states, West Virginia, and I believe it was Ohio, both have no charge or they just charge for copying for the public record requests. They tend to have two different viewpoints, either these people already are government employees, we're already paying them to do this, or the viewpoint that government serves the people. This is inherent in their duty, in their position. I think that's ideal, but I also recognize that in our current environment with things like Tabor, with budgetary restrictions, I don't think that's necessarily realistic, at least optimistically, not yet. So there were two other proposals in my paper that I think are really could change the game for journalists. The first is something like what FOIA does, what Illinois does. And that is looking at the requester, looking at their purpose and saying, is this commercial? Is this non-commercial? And then charging differently according to those designations. Illinois, for example, FOIA, for example, if you're a journalist, if you're a nonprofit, I think at most they can charge you for just copying. You're often exempt from research and retrieval and a lot of those burdensome fees that we face. Commercial requesters are often still stuck with research and retrieval and all that so that the state entities can still recoup some of their costs. And that's where having data would be helpful for our legislators to evaluate the cost and the burden of implementing a policy such as that. The other one, which is kind of novel, would be kind of a hybrid. Nominal fees like we had before, but also with a maximum cap. We would have receipts. We would be able to hold them accountable if they're overcharging us. And we would have a maximum cap if their fee is justified to at least keep things somewhat reined in. So in terms of policy, I think those are the two most realistic options for Colorado journalists, or to be honest, speaking as a former private investigator myself who submitted core requests, just the public at large, I think those are the best things that we can advocate for. So I'll step off my soapbox now. Thank you for listening to that. It's a good soapbox. Um, and so, Jeff, is there a plan for this legislative session? Do you have a legislator that you know of that would be interested in taking this up? Like, what do we do? We, we, um, we don't know yet, um, even though the legislative, legislative session is, uh, is supposed to start January 13th, I think, or something like that. I think they're um, going to recess for at least a month. So we're we are working with the press association and uh, we also work with the broadcasters association since we don't have a lobbyist um, on, on finding um, legislators who would be interested in these issues. Um, and, and there's nothing firm on that yet. So um, I'm really hoping that's the case. What I would urge uh, everyone on this call, uh, especially the journalists to do is, and some of you do this, uh, is really try to call attention to the costs when you have, you know, you make a, a CORA request and, you know, it, you're getting what seems like a pretty unreasonable charge or one that makes the records actually off limits to you because it is so expensive. Um, let people know about that. Um, put it in your story, put it on, on Twitter um, and call attention to that. As much as attention as we can draw to the to the problem that that public records are are essentially off limits to the public because of these fees, um, I think the more the more um, ammunition we'll have when when we finally do get somebody's attention in the legislature, or or maybe that will get their attention, you know, tag Coleg and and uh, and 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 make sure that they know that this is an issue. We we try to do that every day um, on on our social media. And in our blogs, I've put, uh, uh, I recently wrote uh, what I called our holiday wish list, which, which outlined a bunch of different issues, including this one that we think need to be addressed. Also, um, Criminal Justice Records Act 
um, uh, costs. There's really, there's, it's not like Cora where there is a set hourly rate. Um, it's, it's very vague in the Criminal Justice Records Act. And, and, and we hear about that being an issue there as well, but there's a bunch of other issues in there. And, and uh, Justin mentioned records retention. I put a link to our, our previous law school externs report on email records retention, which I'm sure a lot of you have encountered this situation where you request records and they just don't exist anymore because the, the law is so um, vague about, about what uh, needs to be retained and for how long. It's really, it really gives the records custodians a lot of discretion to decide what's important to keep. Cora only says that they shall have a records retention policy. And then when you look at that policy um, that state agencies, for instance, are required to have, um, it gives them a lot of discretion to decide what's important to keep. So we'd like to see some changes in that regard too, uh, because you know, as a journalist, uh, you might be reporting on something uh, where you need records from two years ago, and and uh, and then uh, you find out that the records don't exist anymore, and that could be pretty frustrating. Um, you know, uh, it's I think you know when when reporters were initially reporting on the Flint water crisis, that was you know that something been going on for a long time, and they were looking at accountability in that uh, they found some old emails. Um, uh, with public officials, and that really helped uh, tell the story. Um, in Colorado, you're not guaranteed that those records would exist uh, anymore. So that's that's yet another yet another uh, issue that we'd like to see ad addressed. We've we've got a we've got a list. All right, I have I've put in there like if anybody wants um, to ask a question, let us know, and I'll. One, I was wondering, is there anything in these laws about fees on how they collect a payment? Because that's very inconsistent across the state. Um, there are places that want you to mail a check. I remember when the Denver Post was downtown going to the 7-Eleven and getting a money order to take to the Denver DA's office to pay $25 for a CD. Um, it's just, and it, it, it can slow down your receipt. Like if they're like, well, you have to mail us a hundred dollar check before we'll send you the documents and you've delayed receiving those another four or five days, maybe a week. Right. Um, yeah. You know, that's another thing we'd, we'd really like to see clarified in the law. There was a provision added in 2013, I think 2012, 2013 um, uh, about um, uh, that was supposed to basically say that if, if, if records were kept um, electronically, they could be emailed to you, uh, but it still requires, it does say that they can, they can ask for payment up front. Uh, it doesn't really say what that is or how that should work. Um, and, and so I've heard of some government saying, well, we're not equipped to take credit cards. So um, it, it kind of throws a wrench into that when you can't pay for the records um, online, uh, you might have to go down there and give them a check in person or send them a check or something like that. Uh, you know, these days it should be, it, it all should be pretty easy. Uh, uh, you pay for things online, uh, they should be, if most records are kept electronically, they could be emailed to you or uploaded to some drive where you can get them. Um, we'd like to see some modernization that way too. It's the, the law I think is still pretty vague in that regard. Okay, Skylar um, raises an interesting point in the chat there that uh, many state agencies are inundated with requests from non-journalists, commercial agencies or folks looking to pull mm -hmm. government data to make a political point or run an attack ad. How can we enable the easy flow of information to journalists while ensuring bad faith requests can be accommodated with a fee. I ran into that when I was a reporter in South Carolina. There was a woman who just had an agenda against the city and um, would spend hours in their offices filing these requests with like, I don't even think she remembered why she was angry anymore. Um, and then that would put me in the back of the line because they were like dealing with her. And mm -hmm. um, so how do, how do we navigate that? 
Yeah, and this came up quite a bit, um, you know, in in um, twenty seventeen. Uh, we, you know, we got a we got a new law passed that that basically said that if you, if records are kept in in uh, searchable or sortable formats, you're entitled to them in those formats. Uh, but there was a working group that led up to that, and there was a lot of discussion on commercial versus uh, just individual request, and should they differentiate between the two? Uh, that's the thing we kept hearing. You know, we we we. You know, I, I deal with the public and journalists, not so much the commercial people, um, and that was the big complaint among among um, some of the government agencies that oh, you don't know about these big commercial requests that we have to deal with, and maybe the answer, uh, and Justin, you know, mentions this in his report, is that maybe the answer is to somehow differentiate in in the law. Um, you can say, you know, that this is in the public interest, but it doesn't, you know, there's not enough in Cora to really um, differentiate that. They don't have to respond to those requests differently the way the law is now. And um, it's tricky because, uh, you know, the, uh, the average person uh, is entitled to the records uh, just as much as the journalist is, and actually the, the commercial requester is. Um, so how do you word that, 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 that differentiates it in, in such a way that it's still fair? Um, and, and Justin, you know, did talk a little bit about how, how FOIA does that. Um, and, and uh, maybe that's part of the answer. Um, I think, I think, um, you know, if we try to reform this, there's going to be probably some pushback from from commercial requesters. But but there might be more sympathy uh, on the for the journalists and the public. You know, just the citizens out there who are trying to get information about their government. Could do like Florida and just put almost everything online, and then nobody yeah. has to go fetch it and it's all there for anybody who wants it for whatever reason that is a that is a um something we have advocated for for a long time there is quite a bit of it, of data that government has and so you know getting them to do that we don't have an open data law in colorado not many states do i think only a handful do but that is you know where i think we should be going with a lot of this, you know, put a lot of this stuff online. It takes, you know, government will balk at the work that that takes to do that. And how do you decide what should go, you know, what should be put online and what shouldn't, that type of thing. But that's part of the answer, I think. Yeah, and I would, in my research and my various uh, core requests, I believe it may have been Fort Collins. I believe it was somewhere up north where they actually had a database that you could search. And if you submit a CORA request, they would refer you to check that database first. And they had, you know, city council emails and the like right. up there. So I think that for people that like to say, you know, why should the public have to foot one person's request? I think that hitting on the fact that this is the public interest, this is the government being the servant of the people and that they kind of have a, a duty, I would say almost an affirmative duty to put that transparency out, I think is a good rebuttal to that. Um, Jeff, there's a question in the chat from Elise um, mm -hmm. about CCJRA fees where a police department was trying to charge $30 per four pages for redactions. That meant 15 pages were going to cost $120 and it seems unreasonable they would take 15 minutes to redact a single page. Um, and she just kind of came to a standstill with the city attorney there. Yeah, and so CCJRA, the Criminal Justice Records Act is worded differently than, than CORA. They're supposed to charge no more than their actual costs. Of course, that's, that's really vague for the requester. How do you know what their actual costs are and, and what they can you know put you know, put into that equation. But, uh, you know, a lot of them use the hourly rate in Cora, uh, even though it's not in CCJRA. And the way I would push back it at that is, uh, show me how this is your actual cost. How, if it, how is it really for four pages? Uh, how is, how is uh, $120 uh, 
your actual costs for these redactions. And, and it's, I, think, I think it would be difficult for them to do that, to justify that. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to push back uh, on these. Um, nobody sues over these issues because it's gonna cost you more ultimately uh, likely uh, to do that. Um, so it's it's really frustrating. So that's that's how I would tackle that one: is show me your actual costs to produce this this document. I would definitely agree with that, and that's one area where the receipts would be helpful. Yeah, I mean, anyone with criminal justice experience, it's mind-boggling to me how it would take that long to redact a single page. If they have that level of experience, I. That's just mind boggling to me. Yeah. And it would be great if they would have to justify that in some way. Yeah. That's one of the things in our, that blog that I posted on there of, you know, things we'd like to see is more specificity about costs for criminal justice records because of what Elise finds. Um, there's also no, no provision in the CCJRA for recovering your, your attorney's fees if you, if you win or the, the, the bar for that is much higher than it is in Cora. So that's another change we'd like to see. Um, we've, we've got a few things. Yeah, the list appears to be very long here. On, um, yeah, and we, we've, we've, we, you know, we've made some progress. The, the, the for, you know, getting, getting spreadsheets when you want a spreadsheet is a, is a big change. Um, I used to be a data journalist. And so for me, that was, that was a huge thing, and you know, there's there's some other things, you know, that the legislature did this past year with with uh, uh, body cam footage that'll be helpful once that goes into effect. Um, we've made we've been able to to uh, and police internal affairs records is is another uh, another change, although more could be done in that area. So we've there's progress that's been made, but there's there's still a lot of holes in our in our laws. Linda Shapley is asking which states do it right. Um, who should we, from your experience or your study, um, do it right or at least better than Colorado that could be models? Yeah, I mean, from our perspective uh, and the journalists on this call's perspective, doing it right means uh, you can get public records at uh, for not a whole lot of uh, money or at least not, not something that's cost prohibitive for you or your news organization, or if you're a member of the public. And so you've got states like Ohio and West Virginia um, who, who we could look to, but I don't think that's gonna happen in Colorado. We already have this long history of, of uh, being charged something, uh, but it's gotten out of hand and it's gotten to the point where the requester really just doesn't know whether these charges are, are, are real or not and whether the agency truly is just trying to make them go away. Uh, it's very difficult to know that. I know that you know, there, are, there are records custodians uh, on this call and, and, and they, they probably disagree with that or they say they, they don't do that and I, I believe them, but some do. Um, and, and it's also just very difficult for the requester to know uh, what, what's real or not. Yeah, if there's yeah, any so so to broadly answer that, I think that the answers could be any of, you know, Ohio, West Virginia, Illinois, or Kentucky, with Ohio and West Virginia being the ones that have the least burdensome calls. I think in terms of what is the best policy, that depends on what your parameters are. We all want transparency. And I think that's where finding that government balance comes into play. And in Colorado, I think the unfortunate thing is we do have, you know, financial constraints. So if I were to answer that, I think Ohio and West Virginia are the ideal. But I think Illinois and Kentucky, and I grew up in Illinois, I'll criticize their policy quite a bit, just broadly speaking. But I do think that at least for Colorado, they have probably the best fit for our situation. And, and Illinois was the one that differentiated between uh, with commercial requesters, correct? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so maybe that's one, one way we could go. I mean, we do recognize, and Justin, Justin recognizes in his paper that we have Tabor here, and that 
and that constrains government. And we know that that's, that's, a, um, that's an issue for us. And so we wanna be realistic as well, but we also um, do want to do more to uh, make sure that journalists and the public have access to records about government, that they're truly public records. All right, we've got a few minutes left. If there are any um, public information officers or record custodians that want to weigh in and talk about what it's like from the inside and what you get inundated with, we welcome that. The press club's all for lively debate from all sides and all points of view. Um, so if anybody out there is interested in that. And otherwise, um, we're about to hit our one hour mark. And so um, I appreciate everyone joining in today. I know it's been a wild week with yesterday's attempted coup and unrest at the US Capitol. Um, this is, I'm sure, an ongoing issue. And if you have any more ideas for the press club, um, the issues that you would like for us to host um, discussions about, we'd be happy to do it. It's part of our mission here in Denver. And um, thank you to Justin and Jeff for uh, tuning in today and um, having this discussion with us. Thank you. No, oh. Yep, thank well, you for having us. Sure, I think it's been helpful. All right, thanks everybody.